Father, we ask a blessing on the message today. Would you bless it for us so that as you speak it, that it is clear instruction to us. Use my voice and words, but Father, your word that comes from your written word, that comes through the spirit, that comes from you, Father, will you make that so real in our lives that we are just amazed by you. Father, that's the blessing we ask today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we've been covering... Um, I'm going to pick up where we left off last week. We've been covering a lot of ground. We were talking last week about the new life through the Spirit of God. It comes after surrender. It comes after uh, baptism, which is a physical... Um, something we do that helps us realize and connect our faith. And it also is something that... Uh, helps other people to see it and be moved by it as well. So it's like a statement of faith. And as a result, we begin a new life through the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God moves in officially into your life, and you begin this new life. And then we also talked last week about communion, which is that reminder, that continual reminder of that new life in Christ because of his sacrifice. Uh, when we talked about what does that mean, what does that look like, a new life through the Spirit of God, and, and I think we, we realized last week that that doesn't mean that everything is now smooth, now everything, our troubles are gone because we have a new life in Christ. No, it means that God is walking with you through whatever they are. And the four things we talked about that the Spirit does for you in your life is number one, allows you to speak the word of God boldly. That's what the disciples did when they received the Spirit. The first thing they did is they spoke the word of God boldly. Now you might not be a bold person, but the Spirit of God works in you to give you courage and boldness to speak that you maybe ordinarily would not have been able to do. That's what the Spirit brings to you. We also saw that God's grace is at work so powerfully in them all, in the disciples, and in your life. And that means several things. You know, there's miracles. There are miracles that happen. We pray those miracles. Even the prayers that we talked about just before the, the message, we pray for those miracles. And God's grace is evident to other people. When they see it in your life, they see this change in your life of compassion and they see not only the boldness but they they're witnessing your changed life and so it becomes very apparent to them okay the other thing we talked about is the fruits of the spirit because when the spirit moves in Jesus has a suitcase full of things like Love, joy, peace, forbearance, gentleness, goodness, kindness, self-control. These are things he brings to your life that you didn't have. You got a little bit. He brings a lot. Okay? The fruits of the Spirit. So we keep in step with the Spirit. And then we also talked about that the Spirit will help guide you into all truth. That sounds like something we need to right away if you look around I want to kind of zoom in on this I want to concentrate on this he will guide you into all the truth is truth important do we need truth we're bombarded every day with things and we have to continually ask is this true this commercial tells me if I buy this product my life will change is that true <laughs> I'll, I'll look better. The people in the commercial look beautiful. I'll be beautiful too. <laughs> so truth is one of these things that is hard to come by. When, when Jesus talked about it in John 16, and he was talking to his disciples here, and he was explaining that when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He's going to guide you. He's going to shepherd you into that truth. The things that are true, what are those? Well, we're going to discover a little bit. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Future things. Things we hope for. But then Jesus says this, He will glorify me because it is from me, Jesus says, it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. So really, it's Jesus guiding you into the truth. 
He's just doing it through the Spirit. It's Jesus who's providing the truth to be able to pass it on to you. And then he, the, the Spirit of truth, will make it known to you. That sounds like something we really need today, okay, in this new life through the Spirit of God. So I want to zoom in on that. What in the world are we talking about and what is the truth? What is the truth? It's so hard to come by with the news cycle, uh, the commercials, the things we say to one another. What is the truth? And how valuable is the truth to you? Well, let's talk about that today. All right, let's go. On. We're going to look at John 18. You remember the famous interaction between Pilate and Jesus when Pilate is trying to find out from who this Jesus is because the Jews want him dead and so he's been beaten and he's standing before Pilate and remember this famous line what is the truth and it's it's interesting because in every Jesus movie you know you got the passion and you've got you know Jesus of Nazareth and you've got yeah, yeah. There's, there's a whole bunch of them, right? And I have yet to see one of these movies that doesn't have this line. They can't pack everything in. They've got to decide what's going to be in the movie, right? But they always have. This is the, this is, whoever's playing pilot in the movie, this is his shining moment because he gets to say in dramatic form, what is truth? The next actor has to do it a little different. What is truth? And I, it's just, it's interesting to see how the actors, it's like their moment, they always have this because it's such an important thing. The reason he's asking what is truth is because he's having this conversation, trying to find out who are you, and he says, well, then you are a king then, said Pilate. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world, wow, this is big. This is big. The reason is what? To testify to the truth. Does that surprise you? Maybe you were expecting him to say, the reason I was born and came into this world is to be your savior, to save the world, to be the Messiah, to die for your sins. He says instead, to testify to the truth. Evidently, it's the most important thing on Jesus' mind, right? So what does he mean when he says that? The word truth, uh, the Greek word, I, I got this one, Francis. The Greek word is aletheia. Did I say that right? Aletheia. Aletheia means truth. And like many other like Greek and Hebrew words, uh, they can mean several things depending on how you're using it or how it's being said, but not this word. It means truth, and that's the only thing it means. It doesn't mean anything else. One thing, truth. Uh, you can vary it like truly or truthful, or, but it's truth. This word is very specific. What is this truth? And then, of course, then Pilate says, after he says, I came to testify the truth, Pilate latches on to that and says, what is truth? And the answer doesn't come. But I find it ironic that Pilate is having a face-to-face -face conversation with Jesus and he doesn't seem to recognize truth. Okay? He doesn't seem to recognize it because the spirit of truth is not guiding Pilate into all the truth. Right? Because Pilate doesn't even know what truth is. But he knew something because he left the conversation and went back to the Jews and something was burning in him because he said, you know, I don't find anything wrong with this man. So there was something, but it wasn't fully the truth, okay? Because the spirit of truth will make known to you what comes from Jesus and evidently Pilate was not part of that. So what is the truth? Well, Let's go to John 14, 6, because Jesus tells us what the truth is. I mean, he nails it. He just says what truth is. He says this. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. Now, he doesn't mean to make that sound like a riddle. You know, how can a person be truth? We don't think of things that way. But Jesus is being literal and saying, I am not only the way, because there's only one way, I'm also the truth, and I'm also the life, because there's only the one life that comes in the Spirit. It's all through Jesus. It's all him. And he says, I am. Do you, do you understand how important those words are, I am? They were first spoken by Jesus when he was the second person in the Trinity speaking to Moses when Moses was being told to go to Egypt and let the people go. And Moses asked, well, what do I tell the people? They're going to say, what's his name? What name do you want me to say that you are? What is your name? And he answered, I am. I am is sending you. So Jesus continues this because he's now in the New Testament saying, I am. And there's six places in the, in the Gospel of John where he says, I am, and this is one of them. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way. So what is truth? Jesus is truth. And everything we deal with, every decision we make, every circumstance in our life has to be viewed through that, that lens, that set of binoculars as you view. It has to be compatible with the truth, which is Jesus. Now, you might, it's still kind of hard to wrap our minds around, okay, how does that work? Well, let's continue on. Let's see some examples, okay? Uh, John, we're going to spend a lot of time in John. Um, John began in his first, very first chapter explaining that the, one of the main names of God is the Word, and it was the second person of the Trinity that he calls the Word. And so he starts off by saying the Word uh, was with God, the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and there isn't anything in creation that has ever been made that has not been made by the Word. So the Word is the person who is the creator of the Old Testament. Maybe you thought, well, that was God the Father, wasn't it? No. No one's heard the voice of the God the Father. No one's seen him. It was the second person of the Trinity who was the one in beginning, did creation, and then one day, this happened. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That is Jesus, the Word. He was God, and now he became flesh. Why is, it, why is becoming flesh important? Well, we're going to see exactly why it's important in a minute. He became flesh, which is human. Now he's God and human, Right? He is dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. John is an eyewitness, many others. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. He came already filled with grace and truth. Jesus was filled with these things. He not only is truth, he is filled with truth and he's full of grace. Okay, then in John 15, when Jesus is talking to his disciples and explaining that he's got to leave, I'm going to leave, but someone's going to take my place, he says this, when the advocate comes, that's who's taking his place, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth. Do you see how this is starting to tie together? The spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, because the Father sent Jesus, Jesus is going to return. Now the Father is going to send the Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. That's the name of the Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. He will testify about me, Jesus says. Well, remember Jesus said, I was born and came into this world to testify about the truth, and now... The spirit of truth is going to take over and will testify about Jesus, who is the truth. This is really basic, okay? But we have to lay this foundation. All 
right? We have to lay this foundation in order to understand what is truth. So what is truth? Jesus is truth. What is truth? The spirit of truth is truth and testifies to Jesus who is the truth. <laughs> Say that five times real fast. Paul gets into the conversation in, in chapter one and he brings another element to truth. And this is what Paul says in verse 13. He says, and you also were included in Christ Remember last time I talked about what does it mean to be in Christ? You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. Obviously, this is the testimony of truth. The message of truth. What is the message of truth? Well, it is the gospel, the good news. That's what that word means. The gospel of your salvation. So the spirit of truth is is, is part of this package because the message of truth, the gospel, comes to us through this. We'll see exactly how that happens in a minute. The truth comes to us. When you believed, that means you heard it, you understood it, and you chose it. You believed. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. I love that. I love that saying. You were marked. You were set apart. You were sealed with, with what? The promised Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the seal. The Spirit is the truth. And you're marked in it when you come to believe. All right? The, what about the Spirit? who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is a deposit, a down payment. Your new life has begun already in the spirit. If that's not going to die. Now, you can decide to walk away from it. But as long as you are believing and staying that's not going to ever go away. That life continues. So what is truth? Jesus is the truth. The spirit of truth testifies to Jesus who is the truth. And the gospel of truth is the message to us of what is truth. Everything has to fit that. If something in your life isn't isn't part of that or doesn't agree with that then it's not truth then it's not truth so why do we have to talk about this anyway so why do we have to talk about truth well it's because as you already know we're living in days and walking through life surrounded by things that are not true right and every time you go to make a decision, you have to decide, is this true? Is this right? Is this go along with God? Is this, is this, what, is this Jesus? Is this go along with the gospel? Is it fit in with all of that? If it doesn't, there's something very wrong. Okay? And what we have today, we have deceptions that are coming to us. And I'm going to talk about some really basic, basic things. Okay? This is super basic the deceptions that we face today. You as a believer, you as a person living this new life in the spirit of God face deceptions as well as everybody else. What are those deceptions? Well, how about this? A different Jesus. If Jesus is the truth, the deception is a different Jesus. We're going to see what that looks like. There's two ways that we're going to explain that. The first one is who Jesus is. Who is this Jesus? We'll get into that. And the second one is what he taught. Now you might think, wait a minute. Is that really going on? Oh yes, it is. You need to be aware of it. And our kids need to be aware of it. And our grandkids need to be aware of it because this is going on right now. I want to start with who is Jesus? And that question has been asked ever since Jesus 
return to the Father? And people have been asking that question, who is this Jesus? And in the early days of the church, they were really struggling with the idea that Jesus really came in the flesh. Remember that? Jesus came in the flesh. Well, people are back then were really struggling with that because if he was doing the miracles and doing all these things, he couldn't have been a human. He had to be God, okay, but he couldn't have been human. And so they were struggling with that for two, three hundred years before they were able to define God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They really struggled with how does that work of who Jesus is. In Peter... Peter explains where we actually go to find the answers, okay? And I'm going to give you a hint, okay? The Spirit of Truth has given us his word from Jesus, from the Father, in the pages of this. You know, a lot of people think, well, you know, that's just, ah, those are nice stories, you know. Oh, there's some good codes to live by in here, but really nothing more than that. Some really interesting Stories to read, but I'm going to tell you if that is not what this is going. What this is, Peter says this. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture, no prophecy of Scripture, came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God. They spoke from God. They, they might not have realized that that was happening, but the Spirit of God was allowing them to speak on his behalf as they wrote Scripture, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, allowed the men to pen down words from God. What kind of words are we talking about? Well, Timothy makes that exceptionally clear when he says this, all scripture is God breathed. Breath is another word for spirit. Spirit means breath. And all scripture is God breathed. This is not from people. This is not nice little stories that guys got together and decided to write down. This is actually from God and it is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Remember Jesus said, I'm going to send the advocate and he's going to guide you into all truth. Well, the advocate has already spoken. The advocate, the spirit, has already done this. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't speak to you outside of this. He, actually, he does. And in your prayers and in your study and in your, your time with God, he makes things known to you. When you converse with God, he makes things known to you. But it better agree with this. If it doesn't agree with this, something's wrong. Something's wrong because this is God breathed, spoken from God, and it has to agree with what's in there. Okay? So that every servant so it may be thoroughly equipped with every good work. So, what is going on today about the different Jesus and who he is? There's a lot been happening, um, and we're seeing it in our colleges and universities a lot. Kids are going to university as Christians and they're coming out as atheists. And what's happening is the a movement got started back around in the 1700s. It really didn't take off big until the 1800s. And it was a whole thing about talking about Jesus of the Gospels. These really smart guys got together, read the Gospels, and said, you know what? The real Jesus that walked this earth, the one that, that, that was actually real, he could not have been the Jesus in the Gospels. Couldn't have been. And so they began to, to, to say that the disciples got together and fabricated these gospel stories to keep the movement going because Jesus was just really a rabbi teacher and had a lot of good wisdom and, and, and things, and, and, and they, they kind of fabricated these things. And this movement was growing and built and, and very large, and there wasn't a lot of pushback, unfortunately. Uh, there's pushback today. Okay, I'm going to recommend a book to you uh, it's called Fabricating Jesus, 
written by Craig Evans. Craig Evans is um, he's a scholar. He's an uh, expert in ancient languages, uh, you know, Hebrew and Greek, yes, but even Syriac and some of the other local languages of the day. And Craig Evans takes the, the, this whole idea of, of a different Jesus, a fabricated Jesus that is not the Jesus of the Gospels, and he's pushing back with evidence, okay? And, and he talks about how the modern scholars distort the Gospels, and he sets it right. He actually presents the information as it really is instead of how these guys were presenting it. And you really begin to see how that message got changed. There was deception that moved in. And our kids and colleges and that, they're getting this. They're getting this stuff. Okay? And, 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 and we're talking kids that are taking classes in theology and New Testament and, and the study of the Bible. They're being told, that, you know, the historical Jesus isn't the guy in the Gospels. He was different than that. And the kids are, a lot of kids are buying it. But thank God for people like Craig Evans. A second book that I'm... You, you ever start a book before you finish the other one? You ever do that? Am I the only one that does that? I don't know. A second, bo <laughs> a second book I want to mention to you is from Robert Hutchinson, is Searching for Jesus. Now, his take is to take the fabricated Jesus that they're trying to say that is not in the Gospels, the real Jesus, and, and, and he's using science and archaeology because there's some very, very recent discoveries, like we're talking within the last two to five years even, that are confirming the gospel accounts, that are confirming the, tr the, the truthfulness of these stories. People are saying, you know, these places didn't exist, and they're finding the places. They're finding the, um, the items that they're digging up are confirming their belief. And so thank God for people like Robert Hutchinson who they're pushing back and saying, no, the Jesus of the Gospels is exactly the person that is written about. He does exist, and we got proof, and it's just so refreshing to read that. I'm just glad to see that there are people pushing back. So a couple of books that are helpful to us. Who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is the Jesus of the Gospels. You can bank on that because Scripture is God-breathed and spoken from God. He wants you to know who Jesus is. Don't fall for the other stuff that they're trying to push and promote. 1 John 2. Again, I told you we'd be spending more time in John. John had these things happening in his day. It happened right away. Okay, this is what he says. But you, talking to the churches, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. You could interchange Jesus with truth. All of you know Jesus. All of you know the truth. Okay? He's confirming that to the churches. He says, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. There's lies, but it doesn't come from the truth. It comes from somewhere else. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. The one who says he's not the Messiah, that says he is not the Savior of the world, that says he's not the Jesus of the Gospels, let's say. He's saying this people that say that are liars. He says such a person is the Antichrist. Have you heard that word before? A lot of people have heard that word, and I don't know if you realize this, but John is the only one that uses that name. And he only names it in four places. Okay? But there's a lot of movies about the Antichrist coming at the end, and, there, and it very well may be, you know, certainly, that it is an Antichrist because anti means against, against Christ. Okay, that's simply what that means. But John says such a person is the Antichrist that denies that Jesus is the Christ, that denies that he is the Savior that he is who he claims to be because he's the truth. He says again a couple chapters later in chapter 4, he says, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. This sounds important. I think we want to be able to recognize the Spirit of God, right? This is how you do it. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, remember that, is from God. Remember when John said the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God literally became 
human. And in his day, that was the attack. He couldn't have been human. Maybe he was God. He couldn't be human. The whole idea that God, that Jesus is actually both God and human. And they were denying it even in his day. He says, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. In other words, it's the spirit. It's the it's, it's not just a person, it's, a, it's an idea. It's a spirit of the Antichrist, of being against Christ. Okay? He goes on and he says, which you have heard is coming, yes, in the future. And even for us, there is a time coming where there's going to be somebody who's going to be very Antichrist and very much trying to, you know, at the end of the world, you've seen maybe the, the movies like Left Behind and these kind of movies. Well, the Bible does speak about a person who's going to be that way, called the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. Okay? But a spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. It was already there in John's day. A spirit of Antichrist being against Christ. Okay? It's a way of saying that Jesus is not who he says he is. He did not come in the flesh. Or today, they're saying he came in the flesh and walked the earth, but he wasn't God. Do you see, it could be one of those. You're denying the truth, Jesus. What did he taught? What did he teach? I can answer that real quick. I could give sermons on all, each of these things, but I can answer that in three verses. 30, 31, and 32 of Luke 5. I can answer that in three. It's kind of like, remember, remember name that tune? I can answer that, I can name that tune in three notes, right? I can answer this question in three verses. And you've already, I've, I've showed these verses to you recently, so maybe it'll be familiar. What is the problem with Jesus' teachings? What are people saying that is different? Well, let me explain. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complain to the disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? as if they're not. Why do you hang out with the wrong people? Why are you with the marginalized people? Why are you with the people that don't matter? Today in this generation, this is a very important concept, and that is acceptance. And this idea of Jesus being with the, what they call the sinners, but he's with the marginalized people, that actually appeals to most people in our generation today. Jesus hung out with all these people. But notice, they called them sinners. So this was Jesus' opportunity to say, no, they're not sinners. They're wonderful. What does Jesus actually say? What does he actually teach? Jesus answered, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Ouch. People don't want to be told that there's anything wrong with them. Jesus was clear. He's with these people. He's hanging out with them because they need a doctor. They're sick. They need healing in their lives. The Pharisees and the teachers, they figured, well, we don't need a doctor. We're not sinners. <laughs> well, they weren't ready to hear it, were they? So Jesus is spending time with the people who are ready to hear it. But notice what Jesus calls it. And in our age today, people don't like the idea. They like the idea that, that Jesus is hanging out with the, the marginalized people. But the idea that is being taught now is he's, he, he will join you with where you're at. He'll accept you where you're at. And that is true. There's always truth mixed up with uh, deception. And, and he will walk with you and he'll get into the deepest hole that you've dug. He will get in that hole with you. That's where it ends with a lot of people. In other words, I don't have to change. I don't have to be different. Jesus loves me just as I am. Well, Jesus says, no, you're sick. You need a doctor. And he says this, I have not come to the, call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Repentance means change. Change. And today, the idea going around is, 
I don't have to change anything. I, Jesus loves me just as I am. I can, be, I can continue doing things that I'm doing, and Jesus is going to love me anyways. It's the love gospel. Love, love, love. Jesus is going to love me no matter what I do, and I don't have to change. I can live this life. I can do these things. Yeah, the Bible says it's wrong, but Jesus loves me, so I'm all good. I, I, I can continue living my lifestyle that I'm living. I continue with these things. No, Jesus says you're sick and you need a doctor. We all need a doctor. You know what that's called out there? Hate speech. It's called hate speech. How dare you say that there's anything wrong? That's a problem because Jesus says he's calling us to repentance, which means you've got to change. And so this idea of hate speech is going around. And if you're, if you're going to be say, a person that says, you know, there are standards and there are things that Jesus wants us to live by and we need to change to live by those, you'll be called a hater. The new Jesus that they want to teach is the Jesus of love, love, love. Don't have to change. Join me where I am. That part is true. But his love is that he doesn't want to leave you in the, the muck. He wants you to get you out of the hole and back onto the road. It's healing. There's change required. It's not hate speech. It's love. He loves you enough to not leave you there to bring you out of it. And he can do that. That's good news, not judgment. Okay? So Jesus teaches we ought to bring the sinners to repentance and change. So what Jesus taught is actually, we've got to change. And it's okay. Another new word going around right now is shaming. That's a new one, shaming. Oh, you're shaming me. No, we're just saying, look, these things are harmful to your life. Let's, let's, get, let's get rid of those things. Let's repent and change and get on a new road. Okay? What Jesus actually taught is, no, we all need to change. He's the doctor. We're sick, and he's come to heal us. And that's not hate speech. That's good news. So the different Jesus that we're talking about is a Jesus that is not the Jesus of the Gospels. It's something different. And you need to be aware of it. As you live your new life in the Spirit of God, the Spirit will guide you into the truth. And God's Word is the truth. Look, we already know what things are sin. We already know what the Bible says about our behaviors and our activities and things that are wrong. Look, like I said last week, just call it for what it is. Just lay it on the table and call it. He's going to take it from you, heal you, and bring freedom to your life. That's great news. That's great news. But it requires some surrender, which we don't like to do. Nobody likes to surrender. Go to a four-way stop. You don't want to surrender. Right? Baptism is our statement of saying, I believe this and I surrender to Jesus. He is my Savior. Okay? So those are the deceptions today. And we're seeing it because that's pretty basic stuff because Jesus is truth. So it's obviously they're going to go after the truth, aren't they? Let's wrap it up. What is the truth? Jesus is the truth. And everything has to fit through the filter of Jesus. It has to fit through the filter of the spirit of truth who came to testify of Jesus. And he does it in your life. He does it in this word. And he speaks to your heart. And cuts you to the truth. And the gospel of truth is good news. It's great news. It's healing. It's not hate speech. The deceptions, well, there's a very different Jesus. If Jesus is the truth, they want to present a different Jesus, which is not the truth. They want to present a spirit of being against Christ when the spirit of truth testifies of Jesus. The world is going towards the direction of a different Jesus and denying the Christ that is the truth. And then a different gospel, a gospel of love, not a gospel of repentance, a gospel of love instead of the gospel of truth that you are saved. Yes, you have sin, but the good news is he's ready to take it from you. That's good news. But the world is saying, no, you don't have to change. You don't have to change. Jesus said, yes, you do. 
okay? So in life, we have choices. Every, time, every day you have choices. You have choices in, in, in your relationships. You have choices in your finances. You have choices in your entertainment. You have choices in all kinds of things. When you're looking at your life, everything must fit through that filter of truth of Jesus, the Spirit, and the Gospel. That's the starting point for everything. If it doesn't fit that, there's something wrong with the, what, what the message is. Does that make sense? I hope it's clear. Just be aware that we believers are under attack, and you, you may be called names. Okay, I've, I've been called a few names, but the truth is the truth. And we sang a song about standing. Instead of sinking sand, we sang that song about standing on the solid rock and that rock is Jesus and you can stand on him because he is truth. Amen. Father, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the truth, your son. Thank you for the privilege of knowing your son and knowing the truth, knowing the gospel that you present to us and knowing, Father, through the spirit that our lives are changed forever. What a blessing. We thank you for that. Would you walk with us, Father? And when we slip, will you pick us up? And when we sin, Father, because we are human, and we will, forgive us our sins, set us right again, and let us walk with you. Father, we want the true Jesus. We want the doctor to heal us. So, Father, we ask for that in our lives, and we give that to you, and we ask your strength as we go out into the world as lights. Father, that we can be lights and be salt to the people around us. We just ask that in our lives and make it so real that we can recognize deception immediately. So, Father, we ask that blessing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing a song about the Spirit of God in our life. Let's sing a song about the, the fact that the Spirit allows us to realize that we're desperate for God. You should be hungry for God. You should be hungering and thirsting for God. And this desperation is something that we cry out to God, that we want him in our lives. Ready to sing? Let's sing together. Mm -hmm. 